For our next session, please welcome Havas Melbourne Group MD, Matt Holtham, and World Vision Chief Marketing and Product Officer, Teresa Sperthi. Yes, good. Hi. I'm still quite relaxed from the meditation. Hope you all are. I thought that was pretty good. I noticed a few nodding heads around me. I nearly went to sleep myself. Um, I liked what Tom said about um, we just have situations and we create stress ourselves. I think digital transformation is one of those topics that does tend to create stress uh, in many organizations, but hopefully today we're going to present you some learnings that will help you to overcome uh, any stress that may be being created from those kind of situations in your organization. The reason that we're going to talk to you about digital transformation is because um, it is an enormously important uh, endeavor for the economy. A recent IDC study indicated that about $45 billion worth of um, contribution to our GDP over the next three years was going to come from Australian businesses engaged in the process of digital transformation. So it's not in any means insignificant. However, it's pretty hard to uh, think about that sometimes in the context of our own businesses. So what we're going to do today is take you through, um, I guess, an example at the coalface of digital transformation by talking about the process that um, Teresa and her team at World Vision have been going through and how we've been helping them as an agency in that process. So why do we uh, feel that we're capable of having this conversation with you today? Uh, both Teresa and I have been around for uh, a reasonable period of time uh, working in the Marcoms industry, and we've both been involved in businesses in the midst of digital transformation. In Teresa's case, um, from roles within organizations that have been in the midst of transformation, in my case, uh, working as an agency with clients uh, who are undergoing transformation themselves. Hi, I'm Teresa Spurdy. Uh, Matt's been in the industry longer than I have, let's be serious. <laughs> That's why I'm great. Uh, <laughs> um, I've uh, spent the last 18 years uh, in commercial roles largely from a marketing perspective. And the last 10 really driving um, business change and transformation through leveraging data and digital. So I have a lot to share, not only from the World Vision journey, but my journey throughout my career. And I've been in agencies for the best part of two decades. I've worked in uh, media, creative and digital agencies as a strategist and as a business leader um, here and in the UK and in the US. And all of that's about helping brands to grow. And in doing so, I've worked with lots of brands across lots of industries who are in the midst of this process of transformation. So let's have a look at some of the lessons uh, that we've learned. So there's a lot of stuff written about digital transformation. Uh, a lot of it is sales pitch from consultants. Some of it is academic tenure about um, uh, how you should be undertaking a, a transformation process and what's going to work. But what we're going to do is take you through um, some of the learnings today, uh, kind of warts and all. So hopefully there'll be a chance, and there will be a chance at the end, to ask us questions as well if, if we're not revealing enough dirt around the failings mm -hmm. of the process. So please get your questions um, ready as well. But before we start, we should probably have a definition of what we're talking about. So uh, in light of everything else that's been discussed today, it seems appropriate to ask Alexa what digital transformation is. Digital transformation is the transformation of business by revamping the business strategy or digital strategy, models, operations, products, marketing approach, objectives, etc., by adopting digital technologies. So there's a number of definitions that exist out there. All of them are about change. They're all recognized that transformation is a process. In the context of this one, it's all about revamping the business. It's about trying to make a business more effective and more efficient. Um, and it's about doing so usually with a much more um, concentrated focus on satisfying the needs of customers and leveraging the data that exists in a business. And all um, by using lots of the emerging technologies that we have at our disposal now. Another reason to talk about digital transformation is because, according to a recent IDC survey, 82% of Australian businesses are in the midst of digital transformation. So um, it's not only macroeconomically important, but we're all in the midst of it. Can I get a show of hands from those who think either the business that they're working in now, or, or if you're an agency person, the clients you're working with are in the midst of some form of digital transformation? 
Thank you. That's, that's probably pretty close to 82%, <laughs> as I can see uh, with my poor vision from here. Uh, I was dreading the moment where only one person raised their hand, and I was uh, going to have to throw to someone in the audience to finish this off. Um, <laughs> One of the problems, though, is not that everybody's doing it, it's that uh, most people are struggling. So most businesses are struggling, uh, most agencies supporting their business partners are struggling to a certain extent because it's a challenging task. It is an evolving process and it spans uh, many different parts of the business um, by design. So it's not surprising that people have challenges as they are going through the process of digital transformations. So I'd like you all to go to uh, that URL there, mms.quizjam.com, for those of you uh, who haven't already played one of the Quiz Jam quizzes today, um, and just answer the question for us there. So everyone who raised their hand, go there now and tell us what your top challenges are in this digital transformation process, and we'll, we'll kind of compare them with uh, what other businesses are challenged with, and we'll come back and talk about some of those issues at the end if we have time. So... Um, a Microsoft survey of about 200 Australian businesses said the top challenges are these four here in order of importance. Skills and resource gaps, not surprisingly, when you're trying to transform a business, there's often uh, large gaps uh, between the capability of the current team and, and where you need to get to. Um, cultural barriers, um, cultural barriers that reinforce a lack of desire to change or that um, reinforce silos that exist in an organisation. Often businesses also have issues with a lack of a vision. There's no thought leadership to tell you where you're trying to go. Um, and indeed, there's often not the analytics to tell you how you're going on that journey, if you, even if you do have a vision. So there are, those are all commonplace problems. And they're all uh, variations of ones that Teresa and her team at World Vision have faced as well. So I'm going to get her to tell you about her journey. Great. Thank you. I thought what you were going to click. Yeah. Great. Thanks. All right. I always love a lectern because I'm vertically challenged. And even with heels, um, you can probably barely see me over the top. Uh, so what I'm going to start with is actually to provide you a little bit of an understanding of why. Why does World Vision need to transform uh, in a digital world? And just to provide a little bit of context. So World Vision as a charity has a really strong heritage. We've been operating in the Australian marketplace for nearly 60 years. And traditionally, we've always been an innovator. We were the first charity to introduce child sponsorship, which has been in market for 60 years. Um, it's not going to sound innovative now, but we were the first uh, charity to actually start to leverage retail uh, shopping centres as a channel. And we're one of the first brands to actually leverage peer-to-peer -peer fundraising through our 40-hour famine proposition, which is now over 43 years old. But the landscape has dramatically changed, and we now find ourselves um, operating in a very different landscape to what we were. Uh, in the Australian marketplace, there are 54,000 not-for-profits that operate. It is one of the most competitive marketplaces that I've ever operated within. Um, there's, we've seen massive growth in the market uh, in areas like experience-led charitable giving. And you only need to open up um, Facebook to see a sea of events from your network um, that they're partaking in every weekend. Uh, we've also seen the rise of direct giving platforms like Kiva, which enable individuals to give directly to people in need. And so all of these changes have emerged in amongst a, a context where trust is at an all-time low within the sector, and equally expectations from community and donors is, is, um, around transparency is at an all-time high. And so the net effect for a brand like World Vision is there's never been a more critical time uh, for us to actually transform to meet a changing marketplace. Matt, thanks. You'll get better at this as I'll we go there. along. I'll yes. get there. <laughs> uh, so the first thing I want to touch on uh, is strategy. And I'm not going to talk about our strategy at length. Um, you're a very bright people in the room. You understand what a strategy is. Uh, but what's really fundamentally important in a transformation is that you have a really clear vision and strategy to deliver on uh, your transformation efforts. This slide really summarises uh, our strategy on a page, and I'm not going to talk you through it in detail. But what I really want to highlight uh, in relation to this is what is critically important within transformation is actually what enables you to get there, or what I term strategic shifts that the organisation needs to make 
to enable you to transform. And so those enablers are typically tech, data and insight, people and culture, process and partners. This is where the most problems are usually faced when it comes to transformation and will ultimately make or break your success. Uh, and it's for that reason that we're going to focus our attention on those five enablers uh, and give you some insight into what we've learned across that journey at World Vision, but also what we've learned across our careers driving um, business transformation from a digital perspective. So I'm going to start with technology, and I'm going to start with technology not because it's the most important element of transformation, but it's really useful framing for some of the other key enablers that we're going to um, cover, namely people and process. Too often when organisations talk about transformation, technology investment is normally where they start or where they focus. And the reality is, is that technology doesn't, inter in, doesn't operate independently within organisations. People are usually, usually managing and systems at every stage and any changes in tech are going to lead to a significant people impact and you need to appropriately plan for that and manage that if tech investment is going to be fruitful within the transformation process. So to provide you with a little bit of context of uh, the role of technology in our transformation at World Vision, um, it, it's important to start with that context because it really frames why we've invested where we have early on in our transformation. Uh, when it comes to our market, it's really hard for our supporters, so we call our customers supporters, it's really hard for our supporters to actually see the impact that their contributions actually make on communities and children. And that's because most of our donors will never experience the work we do firsthand. We operate largely in overseas communities. And the work we do is phenomenally um, important and really, really powerful. Um, but for those operating or, or living in, a, in, in Australia, um, they don't know what that's like. They don't know what the needs are of um, those communities and children. So we often talk internally about we need to make the invisible visible. And we do that through creating compelling experiences that really demonstrate the progress that we are making in the field, the impact that um, our donors have enabled us to make, and really provide moments for our donors to more deeply connect to the cause um, that they're passionate about and to keep them engaged with our brand. And so technology really plays a critical role to deliver on that experience-based approach but our landscape wasn't really supporting our ambitions. And so this really led us to focus our initial investment where we were gonna gain the greatest benefit. And so this has led us to invest in areas like marketing automation, data and analytics, content platforms, and most importantly, the integration that exists between those platforms. So what are the, some of the key learnings from a technology perspective um, to take away? So the first is the technology landscape moves incredibly fast. Um, and value is really lost from inaction. Uh, in all my time of delivering digital transformation projects, I've found that it's really critical to focus, qualify, and really act upon your two or three biggest gaps first to get started. Um, this doesn't mean that you're not giving broader consideration to the IT landscape, of course you are, but if you wait for IT to replatform a CRM um, before you start investing in areas like mar marketing automation, you'll never progress your strategy. The other key takeaway from a technology perspective is to always be clear on what your strategy is. Too often I see platforms and tech are really chosen without the organisation or marketers really understanding what role does that platform play and what are the requirements that it needs to fulfil. And so it's really important to understand what need um, is driving that investment. Second area we're going to cover is data and insight. And it, it, Data and insight is what I'd call the glue uh, within digital transformation. Uh, digital transformations are built on a foundation of data, uh, leading to understanding and insight. And if you actually look at the top 10 S&P companies in 2017, six of those top 10 companies are data-driven organisations, and that's up from uh, one out of the top 10 a decade ago. And so data really is a source of competitive advantage. 
Data and insight obviously enables organisations to challenge and rethink old assumptions during a transformation, unlock customer value in new ways, and create new seamless, connected and personalised experiences for customers. So if you're able to effectively collect it, access it, leverage it and disseminate it, it enables you to really understand your customers in, in, intimately. But that's obviously a lot easier said than done. So we'll take a quick look at our journey from a data and insight perspective. Uh, this is a massive area and it's not something that we're going to be able to do justice in two to three minutes. Um, so I will be skimming over the top of, of certain topics. But the first thing to provide a bit of context to where we found ourselves, World Vision is actually data rich. Um, so big tick on, on we've got lots of data. We collect over 40,000 different data points within the field that demonstrate the impact that we're actually making. And we have a, data, a donor base of over 2 million donors past and present. So we had a lot of data. However, this data wasn't easily accessible. So when I started at World Vision, it actually took us six weeks to actually get a customer list out of our database. And that was one list, no segmentation. Um, there was no clear ownership of data within the organisation. And that often meant that decisions related to data were often deferred to our IT team, which usually take a lens of security um, or risk mitigation. We'd invested heavily in research, uh, so we were rich with insight, but we weren't actually acting upon it. And there was very little reporting in place to monitor and manage uh, campaign performance, product performance, and donor value. So we did a few things. Um, the first thing we did, and this isn't in any order, but one of the first things that we've done is actually tackled the data ownership question uh, to ensure that marketing is actually driving the data strategy and controlling how we leverage that strategic asset within the organisation. We've invested very heavily in a data hub, which I kind of touched on before, to really provide agility to our analytics team. But our approach has been very, very incremental. So we're not trying to build a big data project and not extract value. We're really extracting value as we move along. Um, we've evolved the mix of skills that exist within our analytics and data team, from those that perform tasks to those who can add, extract uh, insight and add strategic value. And so what are some of the key takeaways when it comes to data and, and, and insight? The first is that analysts and marketers really need to work hand in glove. Value is really only created from new, new models and segmentation when it's actually operationalised, not when it's actually built or created. Um, what's also fundamentally important to keep um, front of mind is that operating in a digital world and leveraging analytics can sometimes lead teams to become removed from customers. And so we've looked at, there's multiple ways in which you can tackle it. Um, but ultimately, um, analytics will only tell you what happened and why, uh, what happened at, or could happen, it won't necessarily tell you why. And so it's really important to make sure that you're getting up close and personal with your customers to understand the why. We've actually tackled that through instilling a supporter mandate uh, to get closer to our supporters to really challenge our thinking and get behind what the data is showing us. Uh, people and culture. So I truly believe through all of the transformations I've gone through that digital transformation will live or die on the basis of people and culture. It's often one of the areas that's um, heavily underinvested in when it comes to transformation. And by nature, transformations are a fundamental paradigm shift that requires embedding a culture that supports change and enables people to embed the strategy. And so from a people and culture perspective, a, a lot of these will probably um, be areas that, that people in this room can ab absolutely relate to. So for World Vision, locally and globally, digital wasn't part of our DNA. As I said before, we've been operating for 60 years. And it's commonplace for many organisations that grew up in a pre-digital era um, uh, for digital not to be part of your DNA. Uh, we had a digital team that was there to manage digital. Um, and I'm sure many of you can relate to that. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, it's just for digital transformation to live and fundamentally evolve your organisation, it needs to live beyond the actual digital team. 
Uh, traditionally, we were strong as a marketing team in direct marketing and above the line marketing. And the team wasn't really equipped with the skills or expertise to operate in new ways and effectively leverage digital. I talked before, we were investing in technology and so we are gearing up for that investment, which meant that we needed the right expertise to really drive that shift. Um, and culturally, we didn't like change. Um, obviously, that's human nature. Humans don't like change. Um, but it, it was fundamentally holding us back as an organisation. We were stuck in our old ways of doing things. And a culture like that can be detrimental when it comes to transformation. So how have we enabled our teams to drive the shift and what have we actually learnt when it comes to people and culture? So we've purposefully actually hired senior execs that have digital expertise. And it's not one exec, it's several execs that come from a digital and data background. And that's really enabled strong leadership from the top. We've flattened structures to reduce hierarchy and bureaucracy and put people who have the answers closer to the decision uh, making process. We've assessed our team's capability uh, to identify gaps and then worked out how to solve those gaps. Do we hire? Do we outsource? Do we upskill? And critically, by design, when we restructured our team, we actually decided to hire across the marketing and product team um, individuals that had digital skills. So that enabled us to have skills that existed beyond just the digital team. Uh, we've also focused on shifting the culture to one of test and learn and one that encourages innovation. And that's been really tough in a culture where there's a lot of resistance. Um, and so we've had success through things like we do quarterly showcases that enable us to um, showcase new thinking and celebrate new thinking. Um, and we've also continually uh, challenged our teams to act uh, through crawl, walk and run uh, approach. The key is to ensure that you don't try and build the end state in, in the first go. Um, but probably one of the most challenging parts of transformation has been the change curve itself. And it's probably been the most significant barrier. Change is uncomfortable and it's really difficult for team members who haven't actually experienced transformation to know how to navigate it. And so, um, We've been tackling this a few ways. I'm not saying we've got it 100% right, but you know, creating an open dialogue has been really, really important. Um, so we can have open conversations with our team members about the challenges that they're facing and that this is normal in a transformation. Um, I've also adopted an approach that, oh, my claim is not that I made this up, I learnt this through somebody else, but um, actually ask the team, what am I not seeing? And that really enables us to understand where are the black spots? What are we not seeing? Um, and what are the things that we need to lean into to help navigate the change? Um, and we're also equipping our team with softer skills. So, you know, operating in a transformation uh, requires your teams to be able to influence, tell stories, deal with ambiguity. And they're soft skills that if you haven't operated in a transformation before, you potentially don't have. Um, and then, uh, Onto processes or ways of working. So when ways of working are usually tackled in a digital transformation, the driving force behind it is usually the need to iterate fast and release often. And while speed is incredibly important uh, to keep pace with an evolving market, it's not the only key driver that, um, in a transformation that makes uh, ways of working a focus. Implementation of new tech will lead to a need for new ways of working. So will the need to work cross-functionally um, and be customer-centric. So there are a multitude of key drivers that really demand new ways of working to be established as part of a transformation to create value for consumers but to also enhance the employee experience. But they're also probably one of the main root causes of growing pains within transformation. And we've definitely had our fair share of uh, pain in this space. Uh, so a little bit about our journey on um, ways of working on the process front. Um, when I started at World Vision, both campaigns and products were built largely on the basis of internal needs versus market insights and, and, and the donor journey. Uh, collaboration didn't really exist, uh, whether it was developing a new product or campaign. The org's natural tendency was to operate within silos. And that's probably something, again, everyone in this room can relate to. Um, 
Even our own marketing team operated in silos. We had the acquisition team that never spoke to the retention team. Um, we'd also attempted to move towards an agile way of working, but it had really failed to gain traction within the organisation. And so what did we actually do? Uh, to change, we knew we needed to overhaul our ways of working, and we needed to do so rapidly to start to see um, a benefit within the organisation from a transformation perspective. So we actually opted to evolve our ways of working iteratively and focus on designing ways of working for collaboration, speed, and a donor-first mentality. So a couple of examples just to illustrate. We developed a new, new product development process which leverages design sprints and um, we define and develop um, on the basis of the donor journey. Um, so we're leveraging human-centered design to actually dine, design on the basis of the donor's needs. We've embedded a new campaign strategy process uh, and that leverages a lean strategy approach uh, where cross-functional teams come together, including our agency partners, um, and we actually workshop the strategy collaboratively. Um, and that's really driving collaboration for us. And we've also implemented retros on our ways of working to continue to evolve our processes. And we needed to do that because we were making change to processes iteratively. We've also uh, invested heavily in a reboot of Agile uh, to engage our wider teams. And that's really required us to invest heavily in an intensive upskilling of, of Agile. You need to ensure if you're going to embed Agile within the organisation that you don't have a couple of SMEs that are operating in an Agile fashion in the corner. You know, those skills need to be, um, and knowledge needs to be uh, far and wide. Uh, and finally, um, one of the other key takeouts uh, when it comes to ways of working is that resistance is inevitable. Uh, any change is going to be met with a level of resistance. And it's really critical to stay the course. Uh, and if something's not working, really focus on why it's not working and evolve that component rather than throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater. I'm going to hand back over to Matt. Okay, how many uh, agency people are in the room? Can I get a show of hands? All right, you're going to love this bit because obviously partners are really down. important. Um, most big marketing companies have uh, a number of agency partners. They've got creative agencies and media agencies and sometimes they have social agencies and content agencies and it's important because often those agencies are involved or in charge of or stewarding large portions of the marketing budget. So if the agencies aren't doing their job, um, then the success of the overall marketing strategy um, is, is under risk. So it's important that you obviously have the right kind of partners that you're working with and that they are focused on achieving the same outcomes as uh, the organization. And so it's worth spending a little bit of time then talking about um, the kind of relationship that World Vision had and the kind of relationship that they are they're moving towards with their agencies. Um, and we've been part of that. So Havas uh, is World Vision's media agency, as I think I mentioned, um, and so we can kind of speak from our own experience. So um, prior to the commencement, I guess, of the digital transformation process, it's fair to say that the agency partners that um, World Vision were using were were kind of service providers, not partners. They often didn't have a clearly defined role in terms of um, the projects they were working on or indeed uh, where their remit on a project started and stopped, um, particularly as the kind of field of communications becomes more blurry between what different agencies do. So it meant that they weren't necessarily aligned very well with um, World Vision's objectives and it made it very hard for them to do a good job. When Teresa and her team came on board, they took some time to kind of take a step back, change the way the agencies were engaged and to um, change their remit as well. Um, they did a couple of things, and, and I think um, these are evident in, I guess, the success that, that, that Teresa and her team have been having in the last 12 months or so since she's been there. They picked their agencies carefully, so we're the media agency, the creative agency is uh, the Royals. I think there might be some people from the Royals here today. Um, there's certainly uh, Andrew, you're not in the room? No? Okay. Um, but they picked the agencies uh, based on skill fit. So in the case of media, um, they wanted a media agency that was uh, very digitally savvy, that was kind of performance capable and performance focused, but also had one foot in uh, traditional media or broadcast media, or I'm not quite sure what we call it after some of today's conversations, um, but equally capable in buying digital media and programmatic and search as they were in trading TV. Um, and so they made that a, a very strong part of the selection criteria. 
They also wanted an agency that was going to work a little bit differently with them. So our media people, for example, sit in the office with the World Vision marketing team several days a week, and they're a part of that extended team. That also extends to um, operating in a way to kind of augment World Vision's structure. So there's a relatively big marketing team at World Vision, and some functions that might traditionally be done by agencies are, are done in-house. So there's a studio at World Vision, for example. So the way the agencies work is to really augment that rather than replicate it. So even though the royals are the creative agency and they often come up with the big ideas for a creative campaign, some of the execution of that work is um, done through the studio in-house. Likewise, uh, Havas have a search team, but World Vision have search specialists in-house. And those two teams of people work um, seamlessly together to do different parts of the task. And we try and make sure that um, we're kind of working that jigsaw to make it work better for everyone. But um, none of that would be possible if there wasn't a strong cultural fit. Um, and I think culture is a really important part of it because any kind of culture clash between you and your agency um, undermines the efficiency and the effectiveness of what you're doing. And so there was a lot of time um, in the pitch process where Teresa and her team were trying to figure out whether you know, Havas were a good cultural fit. Um, so I think that's really critical to remember. The final area that I think is, is fundamental is the way that agencies get incentivized. And again, this is a a whole separate topic of discussion. We won't try and uh, cover it now in 30 seconds. But I think making sure that your remuneration process for agencies is aligned with what you want them to do is really important. Agencies are often paid for effort, not results. And media agencies are often paid on the basis of these intermediate kind of trading metrics rather than um, any of the true business impact that the media activity is delivering. So it was really important that we structured uh, a way of working in a remuneration model that was going to be reflective of how Teresa wanted us to work, which was a, as a core part of their team. So we spent lots of time agreeing KPIs around what a service look like, what does collaboration look like, um, how do we help them to innovate, um, and how can we effectively measure the contribution of media to business results. And by doing that, we were able to um, structure things in a different way and start to put some skin in the game. So we share in the pressures and <laughs> stresses, if we can still use that word, but also we share in the successes of World Vision um, as an agency as well. So. Um, Hopefully pretty obvious that you can't transform your business unless you've got a vision and a strategy for how to get there. Um, we think what's fundamental is having a roadmap for how to achieve that that includes overt consideration of these five areas, technology, data, people, process, and partners. Hopefully some of the things we've said today have made you go, yeah, we can, we can see that. And hopefully there's been at least one nugget in there that might help you to avoid some of these pitfalls uh, in your own experience. We're happy to uh, answer any specific questions now. My mic should be working. So Dave, can we get the answers to the challenges up as well? Do you want to go through those or we'll take a seat? And no, I'll I think I'll if we have questions. time and it's of interest to anyone, we can talk about one of them later. So um, I want to kind of just, just dig into a little bit more detail in terms of on some of the digital transformation. Uh, and in terms of just starting at the beginning with your tech partner. So how you kind of make that decision? So mm. firstly, who did you decide to go with? Mm. Uh, why did you make that decision? And maybe a bit around what the RFP looks around that. Sure. So uh, from a marketing automation perspective, we've chosen responses. Uh, and from a data lake perspective, uh, we're leveraging Azure. And um, with, with complementary analytics tools um, sitting on top of that stack. The, so what did the RFP process look like? Uh, I think what's really critically important, as I talked about in my presentation, is that selection of te technology needs to be on the basis of strategy. And so the selection process started with that. What are the key capabilities we need from platforms to enable our strategy? Um, what's critically important also up front is you build a really strong relationship with your CIO and your, your IT team. Um, they are obviously the custodians and the drivers often of um, what you do or what you're investing in from a technology perspective and it's really important to have them on site um, and to be working collaboratively with them in the selection process. It makes the implementation process much easier. Um, uh, then from an RFP perspective, uh, so we went through a process of gathering requirements off the back of the strategy, uh, but also gathering technical requirements from our IT team. Uh, and then we invited in a series of vendors um, uh, to go through that RFP process. I think for me, having this is my third implementation on a marketing 
automation platform, so I have really good insight into to the capabilities of the different platforms, and that probably helped. Do you find you end up going with the same ones that you've no, been with before? definitely not. No. And, and how much of a role does the agency have in that RFP? Are they in there with you? Are they helping you make that decision? Uh, not from a marketing automation platform perspective. I mean, we, we, were, we were running a lot of things in tandem. So um, I joined in May last year, and um, we were working through reappointing a new agency um, simultaneously with going to market from an RFP perspective on marketing automation. Um, and I guess h how important or how closely have you been working with the agency on that? Because, mm. uh, for example, some companies might go straight to the tech platforms. You mm. know, h how important was it for you to make sure that you worked with this with your agency as opposed to trying to do it yourself directly with the partners? Yeah, so when it comes to marketing automation, we are working very closely with, that, with the tech partner. Um, uh, and that's probably from past experience. Um, it's, you know, those that understand the platforms the best are those that have built them. Um, I've learnt um, the hard way through, through past experience. But I think it's really whatever you do, whatever model you choose, whether or not you've got the technology partner, the agency, and you know you as an organisation, or just you and the technology partner. What's critical is the role that you know. If you if you do have an agency involved, is what is the role the agency is playing versus what is the role that the um, tech provider is actually playing in that process, and how can you get the the best out of whatever model you're putting in place to stand up your uh, marketing automation capability. And I yeah, I mean, I also think just from um, the way that media agencies work these days is more than just buying media. I mean, particularly if you're accountable to the results, so you have to be working very closely with. A client um, and their data teams to understand what is working to be able to optimize but also to use the first party data that every client is now creating so that needs to come back into the strategy to enable you to be more effective in your targeting and more effective in your investment of the client's money so um, I think the days of the kind of media agency at arm at arm's length mm -hmm. from um, from the kind of data team and the digital team in client businesses are well and truly over if you want to be nimble and effective in, in leveraging your own client data so you'd say you're increasingly spending much more time on digital transformation uh, I mean, we're increasingly spending lots more time with clients, helping them to understand how to use their data. So we didn't in the case of World Vision because the process was already underway, but as uh, a part of our media offering, we have a data consultancy team and all they do is help make help clients make decisions about, about the right kind of ad tech and marketing tech. Um, and then they often help them to execute it. And then, you know, the traditional part of the media agency, if you like, is about activating the use of those technologies mm -hmm. to improve results. So, you know, I think that, that spectrum of services that media agencies are offering is, is expanding because there's a need from clients to better leverage their own mm -hmm. data. Do you worry that, that those introductions to new services and helping them you know, create all these new ways of doing things effectively in the end could reduce your sl slice of the pie as they kind of move over to more automation and ad tech and marketing? Do you, is that a concern? Um, no, because I, 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 I think the important thing is figuring out help, how to help clients grow their business. And I think if you're a media agency and all you want to do is plan and buy, then that's fine. There's still plenty of opportunities and plenty of clients who just want that. Um, our philosophical approach, I guess, is to get as close to a client's business as possible to see how we can help them improve their communications. Um, and media is a part of that, but equally so is you know everything you do in the world of PR and creative and everything across the spectrum of owned, shared, earned, and paid media. So I think any agency that isn't trying to be more intimately involved with a client across the spectrum of marketing channels is probably missing an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And Theresa, you, you mentioned about hiring digital specialists. What, mm. what were those sort of job titles when you think, because that's obviously quite broad, what, yeah. who were you hiring yeah. to help with this? So when we undertook the audit to assess where we had gaps, uh, we made some deliberate decisions to put in some specialists. So marketing automation manager was a new role for us on the basis of we knew that that was um, an area of, in, of tech investment that we were going to be making. Um, we equally looked to elevate the role of, um, of analytics and insights to sit on the leadership team and to be a head of role, somebody who had extensive experience in leveraging large data sets um, uh, from commercial organisations. So they were some of the deliberate decisions we made when it came to specialists. And then that was underpinned by, well, how do we elevate and upskill the, the knowledge across the team? Uh, when it comes to digital, uh, 
and that was critical as well. As I said before, for me by design, the structure wasn't about having just a few digital specialists that held the knowledge. It was about how does our wider team actually understand how to leverage digital to most effectively connect and engage um, with our supporters. And so, you know, that's a, um, uh, that's a constant um, area of focus for us, how we continually to upskill. Okay. Um, great. Individuals. I know we had a lot more questions to go through and I think you guys have done a great job at uh, explaining what, what you're up to and it sounds uh, really interesting but unfortunately we're, we're a little bit over time. so I'm yep. actually going to have to wrap up a bit sooner but thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. Thanks.